In this video, we'll be talking about the replication process in eukaryotes. In previous video, we have talked about replication in prokaryotes. The video link would be provided in the I button. Anyway, just like prokaryotic replication, eukaryotic replication is divided into three broad stages. Initiation, elongation, and lastly, termination. Now, in this particular context, initiation and the termination aspect of eukaryotic replication is quite different than prokaryotes. In this video, we would try to understand these steps in sequential fashion and then try to appreciate the difference with respect to the prokaryotic scenario. So let's begin with initiation. So in eukaryotes, the replication initiation is pretty complex because replication happens in a restricted time point in the cell cycle. That means in the S phase of the cell cycle. In any other particular stage of the cell cycle, replication is not happening. But have you ever wondered why replication only happens in the S phase? Why not in other phase? What prevents replication to be restricted in S phase? You would get the answer soon. So let's look at how the pre-initiation complex get assembled and which phase of the cell cycle does it get assembled on the DNA. So the pre-replication complex formation happens in the G1 phase. But it's important to note that the pre-replication complex is not activated at this stage. So the pre-replication complex is composed of few components. Most importantly, the origin of replication complex, the MCM helicase and the CTD1 and CDC6 proteins. In a moment, it would be clear what are the function of these proteins. And then the most importantly, the pre-replication complex get activated in the S phase. But also at this particular point, no new replication complex is formed. So formation is prevented in the S phase, but it activates. This prevents two time replication in a cell cycle. So it's always a question why cell cycle, why replication happens only once in one cell cycle? Why not twice? This answer has to be understood very well. So let's try to understand. So right now we are at G1 phase. In this particular stage, the replication begins at a particular site, which is basically the origin of replication equivalent. This is known as replicator site. This is a particular site on the DNA, physically located on the DNA. Now in this particular site, the origin of replication complex would bind. Here the origin of replication complex is exemplified more simply, but it is a complex of several proteins. Then there are two important proteins, CDT1 and CDC6. These two proteins are really important because they are the loader proteins for the helicase. So they load the MCM27 helicase proteins on the DNA. So if the helicases are not loaded properly, then how the DNA strands would be separated, right? That is why CDC6 and CDT1 is very important. Now, not only association of these protein to the ORC is important, but also there is a licensing event that has to happen. So replication ev initiation event is broadly differentiated into two halves. One is the replicator selection where the portion of the DNA which would be replicated is selected and then origin activation where the origin is activated with the help of specific molecules such as the uh, such as the cyclin CDK complex. So this is a licensing event without activating the pre-RC the replication cannot start and the bubble cannot form. So how does it happen? So in the S phase, we know the S phase cyclin, which is cyclin E and CDK2 is highly active. So its activity level is high in this S phase. So this particular cyclin and CDK combination has the kinase activity. So it can phosphorylate downstream target. It generally phosphorylates CDT1, CDC6 and the MCM helicases. This phosphorylation event is the licensing event. So this ensure that A, 
uh, the particular molecules uh, dislodge from the complex and the helicases get activated. So let's try to understand why replication is happening only once per cycle. So we understood the licensing event. It is happening in the S phase. And due to the licensing event, the replication bubble is starting to form. But why does licensing doesn't happen in any other stage of the cell cycle? The answer is very simple. The CDC6 and CDT1, once phosphorylated, would be dislodged from the complex. Now they cannot reassemble if they are in a phosphorylated state. So phosphorylated CDC6 and CTT1 cannot reassemble. That is why even if they are present, they cannot form an activated pre-RC. And who keeps them phosphorylated? This is basically the cyclene B and CDK1, which is high in G2 and M phase, end of G2 and M phase. So that is why in M phase or in the end of G2, there is no replica replication initiation again. It cannot happen. But at the end of M phase, the cyclene B CDK1 activity would be down because it would be degraded by the APC. At this point of time, the CDT1 and CDC6 would not be phosphorylated anymore. So that is why they can assemble back onto the ORC site. And this is the preliminary criteria for the origin to fire at the S phase. So now we understand how selectively these CDT1 or CDC6 helicase loaders can assemble at the G1 phase and can start its job at S phase onset. This ensures replication happens only once in the cell cycle. I hope this concept is clear. Now let's move on. So right now we are at the initiation step. Due to the phosphorylation, the ORC complex fall off, the CDT1, CDC6, all of them disassemble. The helicase start its job of unwinding the DNA strands. Now two strands get separated, the hydrogen bonds be between them is broken. And this is really important because the replication bubble starts to form. Now, the first thing that happens after bubble formation is the assembly of several DNA polymerase enzyme. In eukaryotes, DNA pol epsilon and delta are the key DNA polymerase enzymes. So they get assembled first. Eventually, DNA pol alpha, which has the primase activity, that means it can synthesize the primer, get assembled. Eventually, last in the sequence, the clamp loader and the sliding clamp, which is also known as PCNA, gets assembled to this replication bubble. Now they orient themselves into these replication bubble and lastly, the single strand binding protein or RPA proteins assemble, which holds the uh, strands in a separated fashion. It prevents re-annealing of these strands. Now these, in, the, in, in this particular sequence, the DNA pol alpha first synthesize a primer. This RNA primer would be useful for elongating the or extending that primer by polymerase activity. So the three prime hydroxyl end is important for the polymerase to start its job. So then this clamp loader, the epsilon and the delta polymerase align itself properly in this replication bubble. It's important to note that DNA pol delta is responsible for lagging strand synthesis, whereas pol epsilon is responsible for leading strand synthesis. So the clamp loader and the clamp is loaded onto the uh, in the front of the polymerase. It ensures the processivity is more in case of eukaryotic uh, DNA replication because eukaryotic DNA is much longer in context of prokaryotes. So obviously it has to do this job in a processive manner, highly processive manner and precisely. So now the replication bubble extends on both the sides and it's getting bigger. You can see the lagging and the leading strands are synthesized, but synthesized in a different way, which is pretty similar like the bacterial scenario. The lagging strand is uh, synthesized with the help of Paul Delta in a backstitching mechanism that we have described earlier. But anyway, let's talk about the polymerase activity in bit more details. So if we zoom into this region, we can see the bases are added and these bases are added in a complementary fashion to the existing base in the template strand. 
So the Watson Crick base pairing rule ensures that there is no wrong base. If a wrong base is incorporated, the exonucleus activity would basically remove that base. The polymerase would shift backward and try to synthesize it again. So DNA replication is quite a precise mechanism, so it doesn't incorporate error that much. And it moves in a direction of 5 prime to 3 prime, attaching new nucleotides at the 3 prime free hydroxyl ends. So this is the leading strand. So leading strand synthesis is pretty straightforward, whereas the lagging strand is a bit difficult because there are discontinuity within the lagging strand there are multiple primers which has to be extended up to certain level so several times the enzyme has to engage and disengage in this process so these fragments are obviously known as okazaki fragments which we have already looked at in context of prokaryotic dna replication now eukaryotic dna polymerase is diverse let us quickly look at the most important ones, the Paul Delta, which is lagging strand synthesizing polymerase and the Epsilon, which synthesize the leading strand. Important to note that polymerase gamma, sorry, polymerase gamma actually responsible for mitochondrial DNA replication in eukaryotes. Paul Alpha has the primase activity. Paul Beta is important for base excision repair. There are many other polymerase such as polymerase Theta, mu, kappa, all of them are somehow associated with DNA repair procedures. Now let's talk about the termination of the uh, eukaryotic replication. So the when we talk about the eukaryotic replication termination, we have to think about the telomere, which are the specialized structures at the end of the eukaryotic chromosome. The telomere replication poses a unique challenge to the DNA replication machinery. And this is how it would be cleared. I'll tell you why. So let's say we are at the end of the uh, replication bubble and the end of the DNA cannot be replicated efficiently due to a problem known as end replication problem. So here is the end of the chromosome. So we are right now at the telomere. Look at the lagging and the leading strand. So once they are getting extended, we have to understand due to this backstitching mechanism, even if a primer is attached at the extreme three prime hydroxyl end and a polymerase can extend that three prime hydroxyl of that primer, still when the primer is removed, a gap would be remaining in the extreme three prime hydroxyl end. That is why the end would not be replicated efficiently. That is the problem. In progressive cell division cycle, this end becomes shorter and shorter making the telomere short. This is telomere shortening problem that happens. Now, how telomerase can handle these problem? Let's try to understand that. So telomerase is an enzyme which has protein subunit along with it, it has an RNA component. The RNA component is complementary to the end of that uh, DNA molecule. And also there is a tert subunit which has reverse transcriptase like activity. So it can basically synthesize, temp synthesize the DNA without any requirement of an exogenous template. The template is inbuilt. The RNA molecule, the RNA component serve as an internal template. Now basically, this particular enzyme sits on the end of that strand. And you can see there is a complementarity already. Now it can synthesize the strand and extend it. Once extended, it would do this process several times and extend the <coughs> particular lagging strand in a, a direction. Eventually what happens, this particular enzyme dislodges and then there is a synthesis of the other strand. This would eventually help the telomere to be replicated properly. Now the question is how the telomere length is regulated because the telomere cannot be too short or too long. It turns out there are different proteins known as telomere binding protein which regulates the length. RAP1, RIF1 and RIF2 complexes are known uh, telomere uh, binding protein in Saccharomyces. So basically this inhibits the telomerase activity. If there are two, if the telomere length is small, then less amount of proteins would be found in the, in the bound condition. So obviously the inhibition would be less. That is how there would be more elongation. But if the length is long, there are too many of these telomere binding protein posing a very strong inhibition on the telomerase activity. 
that's how no further elongation would happen and the telomere elongation would stop at that point this is how a stringent length of the telomere is maintained but the end of this particular telomere still has a small overhang that can be understood as a potential dna break by the overall dna repair machineries so how does cell overcome this problem it's very easy don't allow the enzymes to recognize this and this is basically achieved by folding the particular uh, end in format of a loop eventually the strand invasion happens and a T loop formation occurs at the end which makes the overall overhang totally inaccessible to any enzymes which is going to repair or any kind of exonucleus this is how the end of the chromosomes are actually protected so telomere shortening is actually a big problem during eukaryotic eukaryotic cell division because each subsequent cell division round can shorten the telomere significantly and scientists believe that telomere shortening is one of the key cause of cellular senescence which is a state where replication pause occurs cell lose its capability to grow or divide and this is a key method by which cells undergo aging so our body undergoes aging with the help of replicative senescence now the problem is one might think that replicative senescence can be overcome if we can increase the telomerase activity and here is another problem telomerase activity is quite high in cancer cells so if the telomerase activity is high the cells become immortal and that's too is not very good for the body cancer cell has the unique ability to maintain the telomere length over the subsequent number of cell divisions so too much telomere Uh, length or too less of the telomere length is bad question is how does a cell decide what is the optimal length still this question is unanswered but this is how the eukaryotic replication ends by replicating the telomeres of the chromosome but before we end this video let me complicate the things a little bit more because in eukaryote the dna is not linear it's no only dna because inside the nucleus the dna is organized in form of nucleosomes and whenever replication or transcription need to happen these nucleosomes are acting as a roadblock so nucleosomes has to be removed or slided in order for the replication machinery to access these regions and it's a huge challenge because the correct correct scenario exactly looks like this where the helicase has to unwind the strands while the nucleosomes are already there the polymerase has to polymerize when the nucleosomes are there so basically they have to loosen up the chromatin first and then replicate the entire eukaryotic chromosome and this is not a easy task how difficult it is to navigate through a road when there is a huge amount of traffic or road block exactly that is the scenario in case of eukaryotic dna replication so i hope this video give you detailed insight about the eukaryotic replication scenario so there are many such videos in my channel watch these videos for your better preparation please share these videos with your friends you can support our channel using super thanks which is a heart shape icon on the right side of our video you can pay using paytm paypal or upi see you in next video